Hi, my name is Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming today's guests from Severance, executive producer and director Ben Stiller and producer actor Adam Scott. Thank you both so much for being here. Thanks, Janelle. Yeah, as like as everyone, I'm completely obsessed with the show. Um, but before we get into it, I actually want to start at the beginning because this is an audience of your fellow SAG after actors and ask, how did you get your SAG card? What was the, the job that brought that uh, that <laughs> piece of paper to you? Ben? <laughs> um, I think it was pure nepotism when I was 10 years old. My mother had a series on... Uh, CBS called Kate McShane, where she played a a lawyer. I think it was the first series ever that had a female lawyer as the lead. It was um, it only lasted one season, got canceled, and I played Susan Strasberg's son in an episode when I was ten, and, I, and that's where I where I got got my card. Ten years old? Yeah, I was nervous. Uh, it was exciting and scary. Adam, what about for you? Um, my first job what well, i did a lot of background work but never was able to gather enough background work to get my side card because there's a way you could do that but i did get a speaking role in a pilot for an mtv dr- like half hour drama it was their first like scripted series called dead at 21 about like like uh Cy- like teenage cyborgs who are programmed to to die when they turn 21 <laughs> and I was coming back to warn the lead of the show about the program and then I die uh, it's like it's like Melrose Place meets Logan's Run exactly exactly that perfect really combo really yeah yeah <laughs> that's so perfect you, you you just came up with the most brilliant elevator pitch and that's going to come back in a second because i, I want to start at the beginning with severance um what attracted you ben not just as a producer executive producer but to direct like most of the episodes i believe six out of nine really almost the entire series i i just i you know loved this script when i read it it came into our production company and um you know the writing was so unique and it just for me, uh, just jumped out as a tone that I hadn't really seen before, but was both uh, weird and funny and and a little bit disconcerting, and uh, it was just Dan Erickson's writing. And uh, I, you know, and then we started to develop it over the course of a number of years. But uh, I wanted uh, originally, yeah, I wanted to direct as many episodes as possible, and. Um, uh, because I really just felt uh, connected to to the material and excited about you know, what it could be. I'm sorry if you've been asked this before, but um, I mean, you're such a great actor. When something that good comes across your desk, is there a part of you that looks at it as an actor too? Did you ever consider taking a part? Uh, no, I never. No, I you know I, I literally when I read this script, the first person I thought of was Adam Scott. Um, I, was, I was this is Adam Scott. This is a role that only he can play because he embodies all these different aspects of what the tone of this show is. And um, I had no desire to act in it and uh, really uh, enjoy directing and not act. I love acting too, but not doing, I've done both uh, over the years and I I really come to a place where I really enjoy just doing one thing at a time, at least right now. And um, this was so clearly the Adam Scott role uh, to, to me that I, the first thing I did was I called Adam and said, this, I read this thing, it's just, I feel like all I can think of is you in it. I mean, Adam, what is it like to hear that from a collaborator that still has to be amazing to this day? I mean, yeah, I was so, I mean, this was like January, 2017, Ben called me and kind of told me the, the, elevator pitch, so to speak, uh, of, of the, like, just like the big idea of the show. Like, we don't really have anything to read yet, but I was thinking of you for this thing. And by the way, I'm so glad Ben didn't have an urge to, <laughs> to act in it because he would have been great. Um, uh, but then it was like a couple of years later that I actually got to read a couple scripts, right? And I remember reading it and just sort of, getting immediately hooked and excited because it's exactly the kind of thing that 
I seek out as an audience member. This is the kind of thing I like to watch. Um, and I remember feeling like this, you know, like m there's no way I'm going to actually get to do this. Like I've been in show business long enough to know when something feels too good to, to be true. Right. And, but then I was kind of, I thought about, it and I thought like, if I am able to actually land this and get to do this for me, at least for me, it'll be as if this whole 20 some odd years of acting this acting career I've cobbled together will be me earning this opportunity to, to be able to do something this good and, and play a role this kind of great, you know? You both mentioned uh, elevator pitches. Ben, you proved yourself very adept at a 20-second elevator pitch earlier. <laughs> and this is not the kind of show that lends itself well to sort of that 20-second, you know, summation. So I'm curious, first, how you described it to Adam, what that elevator pitch was, and if you had any trouble, you know, um, getting people to understand it when you were outselling it, or maybe maybe because of your track record, that was an easy process. Uh, you know, it's never easy to get anything made. I, I, honestly, you know, I don't care who you are, what your record is or whatever, you know, it, it, it's always uh, a, a process. And um, I, I think that's why when you choose to work on something, you, you want to have the passion for it and, and feel connected to it in a way that you know is going to sustain you through that process because it can you know it can be a long process getting getting some. this this uh was five almost five years i guess it was like three and a half years and to actually get it to the point where we were making it and then another year and a half of making it um before it was you know came out so uh for me it was just this basic idea of a you know a guy who goes to work gets has a chip put in his head he goes to work when he goes to work, he forgets who he is on the outside. When he leaves work, he forgets everything that happened on the inside. And his life is sort of bifurcated. And that, and that's it. Nothing else uh, science fiction-y about it or anything other than it's a world that we're not quite sure when it is or where it is. Um, but there's no other sort of magic or anything that's happening. It's just like, it's actually literal science that could, could really happen at some point, probably in the next you know, 10 or 15 years. So uh, that idea to me was the most intriguing about it, combined with what Dan's writing was and the tone of the humor and drama, which was to me very reminiscent and almost based in a genre uh, of office comedy that has developed over the last, you know, I don't know, 20 years or so, I think in American television and movies, um, you know, I think office space is sort of like the Uber, you know, reference um and and of course the office and parks and rec and you know just a certain sort of rhythm and banter that uh we all have come to love and 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 you know it's a it's a great form of comedy uh and very relatable for people and i thought that dan was taking that idea and then sort of flipping it around and adding this whole other surreal layer to it you know if you know, i don't if you want to say it's like a you know like almost uh abstract in that the idea of you know where are these people who are they what are they doing they don't know they don't know they're kind of living this life and and you know speaking in this sort of rhythm and making these workplace comedy jokes but they don't know who they are or where they are or why they're there or what they're doing and that that you know that general idea to me is sort of like well that's kind of like you know life in a way so i thought dan had really hit on something i also would have told people that every time an episode drops, Twitter would go crazy for the next week. And there would be a big, amazing reveal. Um, Cause I was a little bit behind. I was like a week behind on episodes and I would just people be like, oh my God, severance. And I knew I was in for something that week. <laughs> wow, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're yeah. really lucky in, in, in that way. That's for sure. Yeah, people I mean, into it. Yeah, 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 it's great that people were wanting to watch the next week. I have to say, you know, in this age of streaming and where, you know, some streamers are, you know, drop everything at once. Um, when you go out there on a week to week basis, it is, you know, you are sort of uh, clenching your fists a little bit and <laughs> nervously hoping people are going to want to tune in the next week, you know, because I think uh, uh, most people, maybe not most people, but a lot of people now who watch television, you know, will, will um, binge or like to be able to do that. 
which I, I like to also, and you know, how your personal sort of preference and how you do that is, is, you know, everybody has their own feeling about it, but it's sort of like, that's where it ultimately ends up. So I always felt that this show would work as a binging type show, but because of the pace of it, which is a little bit slower and the way things unfold, I wasn't quite sure if people would, you know, want to hang in for each week. So it was, it was great to see that the fans of the show, the people who really connected with it did, you know, I think it's, and I, I do think like it's a very specific sort of thing and maybe it's not for everybody, but the people who loved it really connected with it. Yeah. It was really fun. Uh, being being kind of put out there week to week because I found in between episodes, especially as the season was sort of growing and, and we were in the kind of latter half of it, I had friends who are like jaded show business people who have seen everything and and kind of taking me aside and sitting me down and just being like, so I just have like six questions. Uh, and then kind of meticulously going through all of these theories they have and all of these questions that I could or could not answer. Uh, there was a real connection to the show that people had that is unique to being kind of put out there piecemeal week to week like that. That was a lot of fun to watch people uh, kind of connect to it in, the, in that unique way. Only six. I'm impressed. Honestly, I would have had so many six more. questions. It may yeah. have been more or less. <laughs> and you probably couldn't say anything, right? Not really. I mean, I could maybe say if they were right or wrong about certain things, but a lot of goat questions. I think we're still getting those. Sure. What do you say when someone asks you that? You just like, I don't know, or I can't say, or. Just that the goats were very, very cute. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can't argue with that. I mean, obviously we have to talk about this amazing cast because firstly, I never knew how badly I needed to see Christopher Walken and John Turturro share these tender, beautiful scenes together. Um, once you had Adam, who I assume since you thought of him right away, where did you even start when it came to rounding out this cast? Well, I mean, a lot of it was talking with Rachel Tenner, our amazing casting director who I worked with over the years. And, uh, I think has just this wonderful love for actors. Um, you know, I, I have been doing this for a while. So I've been on a lot of auditions in my life. Uh, you know, the feeling you have when you go in with a casting director, you know, sometimes there are casting directors that you were like really scared of. There are other casting directors you always felt like had your back. Um, I think Rachel always uh, has this respect and love for actors and loves the process so much. Now, most casting directors, I think, are, are like that, too. They love actors and they want to see actors shine. And so we had fun talking about, you know, who, the, who could be who. And I have to say that uh, that that process, talking to her about, you know, certain actors, sometimes she'll come in with an idea. You know, she she said to me right off the bat, you know, what about John Turturro? Uh, for Irving. And I was like, that's a great idea. I mean, you know, I wasn't quite sure if John would want to jump in and, and, uh, but, it, you know, because who, I mean, he's John Turturro, he's got, you know, <laughs> a lot of options. This is kind of an ensemble thing, but John read it and got excited by it. And, uh, and then, you know, John led to Chris Walken. Uh, John, Chris Walken was John's idea. So yeah, it was sort of a, you know, I don't know, it just felt like, I felt like actors responded to the material. You know, they saw what I saw, what Adam saw in Dan's writing. And, um, and the rest of the process was auditions and, uh, and seeing people and, you know, waiting for that person that you feel is really, you know, part of that team and that group uh, that fits into the puzzle. And I, I feel, you know, like we got very lucky with our, our cast. I mean, obviously you've worked with Patricia Arquette, I believe twice before. Um, what's sort of the secret to that ongoing collaboration? Because you work so well together. It's, you know, it's no coincidence that it's, it's also some of her best work. Well, she's an amazing person. Uh, you know, we worked together 20 plus years ago, more than, I don't know, 25, I don't know how many years, <laughs> flirting with disaster with David O. Russell a long time ago. And we had the best time working together. Didn't really connect that much over the last few years. And then when Escape of Danamora uh, was coming together, she was, again, like the way I thought of Adam for this, I thought of her for that. And uh, 
we just had the best time. I saw, you know, she has total commitment. She has a lack of anything having to do with actor vanity. She's just about the role and, uh, and bringing truth to that role. And then she's also just a very decent person. She uh, cares a lot about people, um, as you can see from her other the work that she does. So it just, you know, I feel like this sort of brother sister kind of familiarity with her. And it really helps because I think we both trust each other. And over the last few years, I've been able to, um, you know, kind of take some chances together. And when I saw the role of Cobell, you know, it was exciting to me because I thought, oh, this is something very, very different than what we just did together. And, uh, and I think she can bring a whole other aspect of herself to it. Adam, I mean, I know you've worked with so many amazing actors, but at the same time, does it ever strike you that you're the lead in a series and you're sharing scenes with Patricia Arquette and Christopher Walken and John Turturro? Does that ever strike you? Yes, uh, constantly. And um, just getting to to work with with Patricia and John and, and Chris was like I I quite literally have been fantasizing about what it would be like to work with those three people for my entire career. Uh, so I, you know, I would even would, uh, um, when we started shooting, I took a picture of the call sheet of the list of names and, and would send it to a friend and just be like, I can't believe this and I can't get to sleep. Please help me. Uh, and it wasn't a humble brag. I was really, truly kind of blown out of the water by the whole thing and never got used to it. Um, and we'll never forget a second of it. Uh, it's, it's so much fun. And, you know, just getting to sit there and watch Patricia or John or Chris work is, is just as, you know, lovely as I, as I thought it would be. They're so good. I mean, the whole cast is so good, but I almost worry that I would like, get lost in the scene and just be staring at them because I'm so in awe of their work and like forget yeah. to see my line. <laughs> 100%. Getting to watch Patricia, you know, as we're kind of making the show, we're sort of, you know, starting from nothing, right? And, and you know, Ben and all of us are figuring out the tone because it's a very tricky uh, tone to land on. So until we really landed on, we were kind of experimenting and watching Patricia experiment uh, and, and figure Cobell and Selvig out is like, you know, like wa watching someone, you know, play a violin on a, uh, on a unicycle underwater and doing all three things expertly. Uh, it was, it was unbelievable. And, and same goes for, for John and Chris. Uh, so yeah, you're right. All, it was all I could do to just stay in these, uh, these terrific, terrifically written scenes with them. And there's some actors that people might not be as familiar with who are also so stunning. I've been a fan of Zach, Zach Terry's for a while, um, but I had never seen Brit, and I apologize, is it Lower or Lauer who plays Helly? Lauer. It is Lauer. Okay. Yeah. Um, she is to me like sort of the discovery of the year. I, she just, she has blown my mind. Where did you find her? And, you know, uh, was it just an audition that she came in and, and you knew that she was your heli? Yeah. I hadn't seen her work before. And um, she came in with a tape, but she didn't come in. She actually sent in a tape and uh, I think she did it on it was the first scene that you see Helen in the show and she was on her bathroom floor. She taped it in her bathroom floor and it was, uh, it was just, you know, so enthralling what she was doing and she was drawing you in. And uh, I immediately was like, Oh, this, this person's really, really good. Um, maybe she can come in and we can, you know, have her meet Adam. And it turns out Adam had worked with her <laughs> for the previous year. Was it? No, we just, we worked together briefly, like a couple of years before, right. but it was enough that I knew how great she was and that she would be perfect for there. Like when she walked in the door, it just sort of made sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that was great. That, that, and seemed like it was sort of just very clear uh, yeah. of who she was and who Helly is and 
um, what she was bringing to the role. So, you know, it's hard to describe what that is, but, you know, that's why I'd say like, you know, for actors and I know actors watching this, we all know you go into an audition and, you know, you give it your all. And I'm amazed by the way, over the last few years, the preparation that actors do for auditions um, just, you know, pre pandemic or even, you know, even back when I was starting out more, you, know, you come in, you get your sides and kind of like reading off the sides and when actors come in these days, they're so, so well prepared and put so much into it. it it's really impressive. And I'm just blown away by that level that, that you're, you, we see, you know, that I, when people come in and yeah, right. Full, full on commitment. Um, but it, you know, at the end of the day, you're casting for such a specific uh, role that it has so much to do as we all know with what you, you can't control as an actor. So it happened to be that, you know, Brits was so right for this role and also her level was so, you know, she was doing such good work and was so perfect for the role. Also, it's so much easier to make a tape these days because we all have a video camera in our pocket. Um, the tapes are really impressive that, that people make. Uh, they put a lot of work into into uh, the, their audition tapes. And, and, uh, and I think it's a strength for an actor to audition on tape because you're relaxed and in control of your environment and all of that stuff uh, that, that really ends up, I think, helping. I have to ask a really geeky question. I'm sorry, because you said she did the scene at the at her first scene. Did she have like someone like shoot her overhead on the bathroom floor or was it just a static <laughs> shot and she like stood up? No, the overhead was something we came up with later. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I'm, I'm, I'm dying to see this, uh, this video someday. <laughs> no, it was just her, it was just like a shot of her. Yeah, close up. <laughs> I, I would love to talk about the challenges of acting and directing in this universe because, Adam, your, your character has no knowledge of his other life, either the innie or the outie. Uh, um, do you approach them as two entirely different roles or do you look at them as one of the same? And, and Ben, what, sort of your, the, what, what do you sort of tell your actors when you're directing them? You know, we, we started out just sort of trying to figure out that exact question, like, should this be two entirely different people and should they have, should it be two entirely different characters and, 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 and kind of ended up kind of working through a few different ideas and then landing on something that, that, that ended up being important to Ben and Dan Erickson and, and I, which was that it, it should feel like the same guy, um, both the innie and the outie of Mark, but just like different components almost or different halves of the same guy, one of which has, you know, 40 odd years of life experience of sorrow and joy and all of the things that go into making up a, a full life. And the other one is like, you know, two and a half years old for all intents and purposes. Like that's how long he's been alive. Um, and so it sort of ended up becoming this sort of math problem of addition and subtraction of, life experience and then sort of an empty sieve in a lot of ways. And those two versions or those two halves of the same guy uh, would result in differences in physicality and, and voice and stuff. But it, it, what was more important to me was an internal shift um, rather than some big change in the entire person or personage or whatever. Um, and then there were like physiological things that sort of go back and forth and, and th they do affect one another, even though each one is not aware of, of it, there are feelings that push through from one to the other. And so when we were making the show and we we're actually shooting, we we're shooting the whole season at once. And so in the morning we might be doing an any for, scene from episode one and in the afternoon sometimes we'd be doing an Audi scene from episode seven or whatever. So it was a matter of keeping track of the two different arcs, but also the two different, the, the different things that might be pushing between them and affecting one another and making sure that we had our, our eye on that as well. And I was 
you know, wholly depended on Ben to kind of keep me on track um, uh, 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 of all, all of those balls that were, that were always in the air. Ben, how do you keep track of all this? You must have a hell of a script supervisor for starters. Deirdre, yeah, she's, she yeah. knows her stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, kept all of us on our toes. <laughs> No, I mean, you you know, everybody's working. It's a group effort. So, you know, uh, you know, between myself, Aoife McArdle, who directed four, five and six, um, our cinematographer, Jessica Lee Gagne, uh, the actors, really, uh, everybody is having to sort of be responsible for their own um, part of it. And that's, I think, the thing you rely on is uh, that everybody's um, kind of coming to the process having done their own homework. And that's what happens when you work with really great people. So everybody comes in with a very clear idea of what they wanna be doing. And then as a director, I'm just sort of, you know, trying to, you know, trying to be uh, sort of uh, a uh, person who is aware of that. You know, Adam was talking about at one point being underwater, playing a violin or a unicycle. The idea, it's, a, it's an interesting though, metaphor that you know when you're in something it is kind of like you're underwater with it you're not uh you can't necessarily as an actor i don't think you want to be kind of you know seeing where you're at because you want to be in it and i think as a director sometimes like you you know you can have the uh luxury of you know not having to be underwater and, and like being above the surface and kind of seeing getting some perspective you know um and um I won't keep going with the water now. <laughs> no, please. I could keep going. I, it's um, my fault. I started the unicycle underwater. Yeah, it's like the break. It's not great. A director needs to have a background in uh, unicycle repair. No. So the, uh, the idea is really that, um, you know, I'm just there kind of like playing it by ear, really having an idea of what I think it should be, but I, having to react to what everybody else is bringing in. And that's really, I think, I think that's one of the most important things. You have an idea of what you think it should be, but you want to be sensitive to what's going on in the moment and going with something that happens in the moment if it if it's good and if it makes sense and then seeing where it'll take you. Uh, and that's for the overall process, I think. That's you know, something that, that ended up being, sorry, Janelle, there's oh, something please. that ended up being super helpful was the, the shots in the elevator where we actually change over from Audi to any or vice versa. Um, Ben had a rig set up uh, sort of on, you know, outside of the set of the office or wherever we were shooting. Sometimes we had this rig set up so we could get a couple of those changeovers uh, when we had a, a few minutes. We just run over there and do a few of them. Um, and those changeovers actually ended up being really helpful to just really quickly distill the two sides of Mark down to their essence because you just had to like quickly kind of subtract or add to the mind of the character or the insides of the character so it ended up you know it took us a while to sort of land on what that changeover really is and what it should look like tried it I don't know how many times a hundred times I, I don't know total how many of those we did but kind of doing it over and over and really having the freedom to just find it. I think Ben at one point was like, let's try fluttering your eyes. And that ended up working. And, and uh, just taking the time to do that really helped sort of really distill the two uh, down to their, to their kind of bare components, uh, particularly uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of uh, compact amount of time. I love the elevator scenes. I think every single one is a masterclass in acting, wh whoever's in that elevator. And I feel a little bad because you have these beautiful, meticulously crafted sets. And I'm always excited to see the elevator because I know something good is coming. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's fascinating for me to hear, Ben, you say that, um, you know, you leave room for, I don't want to say improvisation, that's not the right word, but I would think that this show would have to be so meticulously crafted for everything to pay off, but you know, you're, 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 you're living, you're giving room for things to happen organically is what it sounds like. Do you think that um, that's something you understand from your acting background? I think that the best actors make the best directors because they know exactly what actors are going through. 
Yeah, acting's really hard. It's really it hard. It is. I, I'm every day I'm directing. I'm I'm usually thankful that I'm not having to act because it's really uh, it's really challenging. I mean, I love it. I love doing it, but it's very vulnerable, and um, it's uh, you know it's 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 hard to even distill down what it is. What is that process? Every actor has a different process. So uh, I think that's part of, yeah, that's part of being a director is, is being sensitive to what the actors are going through and what that feels like. Um, I, I just always remember, you know, when they yell action, like, you know, you sort of like, I always feel like action. I always like tighten up or, you know, like you have to, somebody wants to, you don't have to do anything when they yell action. Um, and that was like, oh yeah, I guess, right. So, you know, sometimes it's just things like that, that can, for me, I, rem I remember as an actor that I try to sort of in some way be aware of, you know, and, and certain actors like it in certain ways, you know, and, and that's the other thing, like just being aware of how to, you know, work with different actors. And, you know, that, that's the thing where sometimes some people get, you know, their first or second take is really you know, their, their best and other actors need a few takes to work up to it and all that stuff. I think it's just letting, you know, when a director comes up to you and starts talking to you, some, sometimes I've had this with Patricia too, you know, who now at this point we know each other pretty well, but, you know, I would come up to her after a take or two and go like, hey, I think this, that, and she'd be like, just, you know what, just let me do it a couple of times. <laughs> um, and I'd be like, yeah, okay. And it's like, she, she, she and I totally get that because she's just basically saying, let me just like figure this out a little bit before you start giving me feedback. And then, you know, that's that's great. I, I, I you know, that's the process you want to have where actors can just feel like they can figure out how they are going to best uh, get there. And uh, I, I think that's, you know, as a director, you just want to figure out whatever that process is for each actor and be helpful to it. <laughs> Having been as an actor for me was was really a, a great sort of point of connection because when we were starting, it was this sort of uh, the, the show was in front of us. A Amy Puller always calls used to call starting a new show from the start, like being at the bottom of show mountain where you have this like sheer face of show in front of you and you're going to have to start chipping away and building it from climate from the ground up. And so when the whole thing was in front of us, the job itself was this gargantuan thing. And so I made it the, the choice, uh, the decision right away to just surrender and put all of my trust into, into Ben because I trust him so much just as a person, but also I trust his taste uh, as, as a director and actor. And so and I'm so glad I did that. I decided not to just keep that for actors. There's a, for me, at least, there's always like this third eye I keep on myself, like watching myself to kind of make sure I'm not doing anything, painting outside the lines too much or doing something that doesn't make sense. And I think part of that comes from not being totally sure of a director and not knowing if I totally trust what they're going to use or not, or if, if I know if they know if something's good or not. With Ben, I just decided to get rid of that completely and 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 realized I probably wasn't going to be able to do this job if I was keeping that eye on myself. Anyway, it's a good habit to break regardless, but I'm so glad I just pushed it all over onto Ben and just completely depended on him and I could just dive in as much as I could. Um Bear with me because <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to word this, but I would think one of the biggest challenges of, of playing Mark is forgetting things you're not supposed to know. Like when you're sharing scenes with Ms. Casey, you know, your innie doesn't know right. that that's, you know, his wife or was his wife. Right. Outside. Um, and you can't give anything away because, you know, Reddit will go crazy with, <laughs> with clues. Right. Um, did you I, know? I, I, sorry. No, no. We, when we were shooting... We cared about the show and these specifics and all these things you're talking about, which was sometimes would be like a little bit of a wormhole to go down because there's so many yeah. questions when we were shooting. But we did not know that Reddit would go crazy. We could we thought, well, maybe some people will care about this, but we did not know that when the show came out, the level of how people would 
go get into the weeds with it. It was that which for me was a, I mean, it was wonderful to see how people really took it in, but the microscope level of, uh, of how, what people infuse and the questions they ask, we had no idea. I think when we were shooting that people would be that, um, you know, would care that much about those specifics. I think. No idea. I'm so, I'm glad we were so nerdy about it because we, we, it needed to be pretty airtight. Yeah. <laughs> was that ever, as it turns out, <laughs> was that ever challenging though, to, to, cause I'm assuming you knew everything going in you, you yeah. know, the actor, um, was yeah. it then challenging to like, be like, I can't remember, I can't give any hint that this person, I, I even knew them outside of this world. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, sometimes, uh, before a scene, we would just sort of catch up and remind ourselves exactly yeah. what just happened, what, what, what's still to come. I need, let's be careful about, uh, about giving too much here to Ms. Casey to, we don't need, you gotta be really, really careful about, um, what this could look like rather than what it is. And so, um, so yeah, we were constantly thinking yeah. about that and, and constantly trying to, uh, trying to uh, make sure that that everything was straight and and it was a lot to sort of keep straight but you know there were a bunch of us and we we would just talk about it before uh before we shoot a scene i i would say that adam you know in terms of like what he was playing because it was so complicated um would we would have these conversations and one scene in particular i'm thinking about is when when miss casey and mark are together in the wellness room after we found out in episode eight that we know their history. Um, we talked about that scene a lot. And I just remember in working on that scene, the subtle, I, I was very concerned that the subtlest sort of, you know, acknowledgement or connection would tip things one way or the other. And in that scene in particular, um, or the scene, which we, I remember we added later after we had been editing episodes of Mark and Miss Casey passing each other in the hallway of the break room. Oh yeah. Um, but I felt like that was important to have to sort of like just have one moment where we see the two of them together before, and that's like an episode six or something to see before we have this scene where we, where we find out. And, um, and then the subtlety that Adam is playing and Deachin too, it's just incredible. Like the level, like this, the different takes, that I would come through when we were editing in terms of the levels of subtle acknowledgement or what's beneath the surface or what might be coming through that they're not aware of what both actors were doing to me was so impressive. So Thanks, before we go, I obviously have to ask, and I know you probably can't say much, but um, what is season two going to look like? Is there anything you can reveal? Have you started yet? Um, what can you tell us? <laughs> can tell you nothing. <laughs> we will be using cameras and actors. Um, Spalding, you'll have nothing in. Uh, uh, I understood that. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Uh, one of my favorite movies ever. Uh, I, I, you know, it's really hard. It's really hard. There'll be actors and cameras, and you know, people you saw in the first season. I, I think it's really, it's really tough. You know, I think the hope is that. Uh, on my end is that we're going to continue this story in a way I, I felt during the season that a lot of people as the episodes were happening I it was interesting to you know hear reaction from people who were concerned fans were concerned like oh I'm liking this I hope this all ends up somehow coming together or making sense I don't want it to be one of those shows I never even heard this term mystery box or puzzle box oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I didn't even know what that term was um, I guess we're one of those but, you know, to me, that's never been what the show is about, all those unanswered questions. It's about the characters. And, but as a viewer, of course, you're like, you have all these questions. So to me, though, the point of the show should be that you're always enjoying the show and, and not, never feeling as if, you know, you're being manipulated in some way that is artificial. And yeah. that's, that's my hope and goal with the show is that, you know, ultimately as the show progresses, that people are going to feel like, okay, I'm in a world that, you know, is every, you know, everything's happening for a reason and it's thought out and people are not just sort of playing with me. That's my hope. 
yeah, there aren't puzzle boxes just for the sake of puzzle boxes. Thank I you. guess it's all, it's all connected to characters and, and all of that good stuff. Will we see more goats? Can you promise that or? <laughs> you can't say, can't say. Oh, okay. I mean, we can see, if you want to see goats, there's other places you can see goats. You might see Google it. image search. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think Apple's going to do a goat series after their like yep. CG goats, like after the prehistoric planet. It's like just narrated by Chris Evans. Yeah, I would watch that in a heartbeat. Me too. <laughs> um, well, again, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, I feel like I'm in such good hands watching this show because, like you said, I feel like you there are answers, and even if we don't get them, I feel like the team knows them, which is a lot more than sometimes when I watch other shows. I get very nervous that I get invested in. And, and even if you don't, I'm having such a good time enjoying it. <laughs> um, so you, I want to- you, You've given us a little, uh, there's like a little Easter egg there behind you, right? Your yes, Easter and egg. I people who, who oh, cool. fairly regularly will know that, that I didn't place that there, that, that, that the pink box is usually just there, yeah. as a matter what of fact, it, yeah. What does the pink represent? What does the green represent? <gasps> the Indian and the Audi. Oh, okay, good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank you so, so much for sharing your process and your thoughts with your fellow performers. Um, so, so happy to have you here. Thanks. And I also want to say thanks to everyone who watching, who cared about the show, because like Ben said, up until February, we were the only ones that cared about all this stuff. <laughs> We've had a couple moments of being like, can you believe everyone else cares about this now? Uh, it's It's just so lovely and 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 we had so much fun putting it together and i'm so glad that people are having fun watching it oh they so care thanks. they care passionately <laughs> it's yeah. pretty funny it's been really a really nice experience and it's been great talking to you. thank you yeah thanks so much